No one has more state pride than New Mexicans. The vibrant culture, bold flavors, unique history and dramatic landscapes under our Zia sun are like no other. And the people of New Mexico are a rare breed. As diverse as we are, together we breathe life and soul into this high desert land, a land that promises adventure. I'm Michael Newman, and as your host, I'll be taking you with me as I seek out the best the land of enchantment has to offer. New Mexico, so it feels like home to me. It feels so true. It's time well spent when I spend it. Thanks for watching another episode of New Mexico True Television. I'm your host, Michael Newman. In this episode, we're exploring Colfax and Hardin counties, locations that have inspired some of the greatest Western lore we know today. Three hours north of Albuquerque off US 64 is the town of Cimarron, where I am taking a historic lantern light tour with Jared Chatterley. Cimarron is Spanish in origin. It's actually pronounced Cimarron, and it means wild, untamed, unruly. From the business developed through the Maxwell Land Grant to the commerce along the Santa Fe Trail and the gold rush of the 1860s, Jared weaves together the storied history of Cimarron. And the event that really made Cimarron live up to its name was known as the Colfax County War. And from 1872 to 1882, this was the county seat for Colfax County. This is the Old Town Plaza. It was built by Lucian Maxwell as part of his ranch headquarters. And it was very common for wagon trains uh, traveling the, the mountain branch of the Santa Fe Trail to circle their wagons here in the plaza to water themselves and their livestock from the well and then continue on down the trail. So we are standing on the mountain branch of the Santa Fe Trail right here. Our next stop is actually this building kind of behind us here. It was known as the Lale House. And supposedly during the stage days, there was a woman who worked here who kind of functioned as a midwife for people traveling the Santa Fe Trail. Mm -hmm. and of course, in those days, infant mortality was very high, so children that were stillborn or died during or after childbirth, she would take their bodies and bury them on the hillside back behind this building. Oh. And as that <laughs> hillside <laughs> has eroded over the decades, there have been little skeletons found. So it kind of gives us appreciation of how difficult life was back in, the, in the, the stage days. Unlike the mass graves, though, are the tombs of the Bobian Maxwell plot. You can tell a lot about the Maxwells by the way these people were buried. Back in those days, if you were poor and passed away, they rolled you up in a blanket, stuck you in the ground. To be buried like this makes you have a lot of money. No doubt who were the royalty of Cimarron, but we make our way across town to a place where some of the less desirable characters of Cimarron spent their time. Given what's coming, the moonlit sky takes on a more eerie hue. So in 1872, this building was built as the Colfax County Jail. It was the functioning jail in Cimarron until the 1960s. Now, uh, this jail does not boast the fact that no one escaped out of it. People escaped out of this jail all the time. <laughs> Particularly during the Colfax County War days, if you had the right political connections, they would just uh, you know, open the jail, turn their back, and you just doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> There were people who were murdered in this jail. So the folks that live in the house here, people who have stayed in the RV park, claim the jail is haunted. They've heard chains rattling, doors slamming, people moaning. Having said that, we're gonna go ahead and go on inside and see what paranormal activities we may encounter. <laughs> After you. I can feel yeah. the walls kind of... Kind of crazy, <laughs> yeah. not Exactly. Sometimes I tell folks that uh, people who died, there was no arrangements made. They just walled them up in the walls. That's <laughs> where you get the phrase dead space from. <laughs> While some have tried it in the past, I'm glad this tour doesn't include a sleepover in the local jail. But if ghosts are what you're after, you can always spend the night at our next stop. St. James Hotel. The St. James was built by a Frenchman. His name was Henri Lambert, Henry Lambert. And he came here from France in the 1860s and actually got involved in the Civil War. He became head chef for Ulysses S. Grant in the Union Army. Grant talked him up so well, he became head chef for Abraham Lincoln in the White House. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. Henry Lambert's kind of out of a job. He hears about the gold rush going on out here, comes out to look for gold. That doesn't pan out. Doom, doom, 
<laughs> oh, come on. I was waiting for it. So uh, he went back to doing what he knew best, and with a loan from Lucian Maxwell, built the St. James Hotel. Originally, it had 44 rooms, boasted the best food and the best drinks in town, so it was the most popular place. It was also home for most of the violence. Uh, 28 men were shot, murdered, killed, died. The big question is, is it haunted? I personally believe it is. There's three known ghosts to haunt the hotel, two of which were Henry Lambert's relatives. The who's who of the Wild West has stayed here. The Earps on the way to Tombstone, Bat Masterson, Jesse James, Annie Oakley, Buffalo Bill, uh, Clay Allison, Black Jack Ketchum. So if not the premier landmark in northeastern New Mexico, it is definitely the premier landmark here in Cimarron. The 12 original rooms of the St. James are named for the famous outlaws who stayed here. Ask any of the staff about their favorite ghost stores. If you want lodging with all the charm but without the turbulent past, check out the Cimarron Inn and RV Park. And Jared's tourists run through the summer months. Check his website for details. Coming up, the legacy of the man named Mills. And now from the pages of New Mexico Magazine. Two hours north of Santa Fe off I-25 is the town of Springer. And at the end of First Street, you'll find the historic Mills Mansion, a looming structure whose grandeur holds the promise of legendary tales. This was the home of Melvin Mills, a man whose mythology is as rich as the architecture of the manor he left behind. And today, I will step inside his world. Ah, oh, look at that red light coming straight in, huh? Oh yeah, that's part of the original building. Um, when the sun's shining through it just perfect, it lights up this whole room. It looks like a prairie wildfire. <laughs> Gone with the wind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love all these huge windows too that lets all the light in. I bet back in, in that day, in Springer, this was the creme de la creme, like this was a house everybody looked up to on the hill. It's been called, uh, it was the Ritz for its time. Wow. It's, it's Mills' architectural legacy. Uh, but if there's one thing, you know, Mills was uh, always gonna do is he would do something extravagant. Mm -hmm. You know, half measures weren't his thing, <laughs> you know. So who was Mills and what role did he play in Springer history? He's Canadian huh. um, originally. Yeah, he was born in Sparta, Ontario. Okay. Um, his family, uh, you know, he was still while he was in his boyhood, they moved down to uh, Michigan mm -hmm. where he ended up going to college. Right. Graduated with a law degree and uh, moved down to New Mexico, yeah, where he became, you know, a DA, a state legislator. Mm -hmm. um, he was instrumental in um, getting the, uh, uh, the railroad to come through here. Right. The, um, he started an orchard down here, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. he, he always had his hands full of projects. Was he one of like the founding fathers of Springer? Yes, he, he, he you know, got a legislative seat here. Um, he was Springer. His exploits afforded Mills the luxury of this 20-room residence, which housed his parents, wife, and five adopted children. But this family man was awash in rumors. There's a lot of rumors surrounding Mills. Okay. Okay, so at one point, Mills is accused of killing a reverend. Wow. Okay, now mm -hmm. this is funny because Mills is raised a Quaker mm -hmm. and practices nonviolence. <laughs> non right. So actually, a mob was forming to kill Mills. Wow. Yes, and the cavalry came at the last possible second mm -hmm. and saved him, spirited him away. Wow. Okay, so from there, you get this rumor that he had underground tunnels. And one of them led to the bank, you know uh, what I mean? Because he was expected uh, to have money, you know weird. what I mean? He was successful, he was a big showboater. The other one was supposed to go down into a secret escape route. Mm -hmm. Now they did dig up a little bit of the basement looking for the tunnels and they never did find them. Interesting. <laughs> the mystery is still there. No, no, you can feel the history, you can feel the legacy. Yeah, yeah. You can almost feel Mills in here sometimes, right. I feel like. So if you do feel it's haunted, you know, yeah. he might be in here still. Right, You know, right, this right. is his pride and his joy, it is his legacy, so yeah. Cool. Oh. Wow, this is quite the grand entry to the house. Oh, yes. No, this is an amazing staircase. This is actually, after you come through the front door, this is the first thing you see. Uh -huh. And this is the oldest, longest handmade staircase in New Mexico. Oh, wow. Yes, it goes up all three stories. It's amazing. Wow, that's crazy. And then on the second floor, we come out to the veranda. Wow. Imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine sitting up here on a rocking chair with your pipe yeah. or whatever, looking out at the lightning playing on the, on, on the prairie. Right, but this is like, <laughs> yeah, this is straight out of a movie, man. Yes, yeah. a Western movie. Right, but Mills, Mills definitely had the, a life, a yes. scene that he kind of created here. But this estate, as grandiose as it is, is just one chapter of a very rich life. To delve further into the history of the man named Mills, 
I head south to the canyon where his beloved Mills Orchard Ranch once stood, where acres of fruit trees and vegetables thrived prior to the devastating flood of 1904. Tucked along the red cliff faces are remains of the main house, bunkhouse, smithy, and corral, ruins whose walls once held the dreams and aspirations of Mills, dreams swept away by the waters of the Canadian River. If you come all the way out here, bring a tent and take advantage of the magnificent campground. And don't miss Mills Town off Highway 39. Tours of the mansion are by appointment only. Schedule in advance. For more great stories like this from New Mexico Magazine, visit newmexico.org. Under three hours north of Albuquerque in the center of Springer sits the Santa Fe Trail Museum. Maria, can you tell me the story that's being told in this museum? Is there a kind of a theme happening here? Well, this building was originally started in 1879. That's about the time that Springer itself was established, which in the beginning we were called Maxwell. This was the courthouse. This would have been the Colfax County seat. Any court hearing, any trial would have been done right here in this room. This is where the judge would have sat um, and his quarters would have been right behind. Later on, as Raton, New Mexico became more established, they wanted the court, the sea, to be moved there. Okay. So they actually came on horseback by gunpoint to get Springer to release the records. And um, we really didn't look kindly upon that, so we refused to let up the records. So they had to get a writ of mandamus, which was filed with the courts in 1899, ordering Springer to release the records and move the county seat to uh, Raton, New Mexico. And then at that point, the building kind of served the purpose as one of the very first boys' reformatory schools. Okay. So fast forward to now, what are some of the, I guess, the artifacts that kind of, um, that tell that story? Well, I think if you talk to most people who visit the museum, mm -hmm. the things that pop out the most are going to be the electric chair. Mm -hmm. and it's the only electric chair ever used in the state of New Mexico. It was responsible for eight to nine executions. So that's probably the most predominant. The second one is the jail cells because okay. we have two jail cells, on one on this floor, one on the bottom floor that we've kind of left in its, their original form. Sure. So I think they just really like being able to walk in and see those. Mm -hmm. It's interpretive. You're getting a visceral experience of what life was like in that time. Exactly, and what we tell most people when they come in is that the bottom floor, all the items on the bottom floor are an interpretation of items that you would have found during the Santa Fe Trail. Okay. Upstairs is kind of like donated, benefacted items, things that have been given to the museum. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll call it a museum of tchotchkes of sorts, like <laughs> right, just right. given things, yes. Yeah, but sometimes those are the most interesting things because it makes it real, you know? Exactly, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, the other item not a lot of people like to go up there are the gallows. Okay. We have, right. a, you know, an official gallows. They were never used. Mm -hmm. We had one public hanging that was done here in Springer, but the, because the gallows were not complete, it was done outside. Okay. With the electric chair and the gallows, I mm -hmm. think that we do have people that like to think that there's some hauntings or some things right, that are here. Yes. Right. And with the, with the scary, you know, prison <laughs> cells down there, you guys got a theme. I, I, I we see We definitely it. have a theme going on. <laughs> the legends of the Untamed West are wrangled into this one collection, and even some unrelated but intriguing items have found their way here. Look for relics from a giant upstairs, and the newly refurbished Broken Arrow Motel down the street makes for a great launch point to adventures along the Santa Fe Trail. Stay tuned for a mill turn museum. Do you take a lot of pictures on your New Mexico travels? Well, if you do, show us by hashtagging New Mexico True on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Often the road less traveled is the same path to discovering the soul of a place. And in our journey through the northeastern part of the state, Highway 39 is one such road. Cutting through wide, open grasslands, this ribbon of highway weaves through the same landscape that welcomed homesteaders more than 100 years ago and whose prairies still provide a way of life for ranchers today. You'll pull into towns like Mosquero, places nearly forgotten in time, but whose hometown pride is evident in the freshly painted buildings, where murals celebrate the people who live here, honoring their values and customs. The imagery of these walls reflect the journey you've made through this quiet pocket of our state, where people are outnumbered by wildlife. Considered by many to be New Mexico's home on the range, in Harding County, I found my own home away from home. In the rectory behind the Catholic Church is a luxurious guest house, possibly the best kept secret of the county. Lovingly restored and artfully furnished, this bed and bath is reason enough to stay a while and will certainly be a reason to return. Perched on a hillside off New Mexico 21 in the town of Cimarron is the old Aztec Mill Museum. 
Built in 1864 by Lucian Maxwell, this gristmill now houses regional artifacts and memorabilia. So fellas, here we are in the basement of what's got to be an uh, over a hundred year old building. What role did this building play in the greater regional history? Well, it was one of the only mills in this entire area, especially one of the first mills uh -huh. built out of rock just from one of the mesas nearby. It served as the main mill for, for the Indian population. This was the local Indian uh, agency. And it also um, served as the headquarters of Lucian Maxwell, who ultimately owned the Maxwell Land Grant. Okay. He got it from his father-in-law, Charles Bobien, um, but during the Taos Revolt of 1847, Bobien's only son was killed, and so Bobien looked around for someone who could help manage this large land grant. It was over a million acres or something? One, it turned out to be 1.7 million acres. It should have been 96,000 <laughs> wow. acres according to Mexican law, but it was, mm -hmm. ended up being about 20 times larger. And he looked around and had his son-in-law, Lucian Maxwell, and his good friend Kit Carson. Mm -hmm. uh, they had just spent a few years earlier in the early 1840s um, going with John Fremont on government expeditions out to California. So the two of them thought they were feeling a little old. Um, Carson was in his 40s and Maxwell in his 30s, and they agreed to come on over here and manage the land grant for him. There were a couple of buildings already on the Cimarron River, and Maxwell built this mill to serve, as was mentioned, the local Indian agency, mm. and provide grain, um, cattle, and horses to the soldiers here, as well as Fort Union. This was the start of present-day Colfax County. And how long was it in operation here? Well, the mill was built from 1860 to 64 and only used for 12 years. Oh, wow. In 1876, the Native Americans were relocated and the mill no longer had a function. During that time, or right after that time, what, how, what happened to the mill or how did it kind of get to where it's at now? <laughs> then it was just used as ranch storage. It was still used as ranch storage until about 50 years ago when Fred Lambert, son of Henry Lambert who built the hotel, looked at this and said, why don't we turn it into a museum? He put floorboards in. Being from the Lambert family, they had a lot of stuff from the hotel. They were here in the 1870s, and the Springer family had a lot of stuff too. They were here from the 1870s, and that's the bulk of the collection. Coming into this space, they kind of saw it as a gold mine of telling the, the mm -hmm. story of what it was like before. Yeah, essentially, what we have in the museum is what people grew up with for the past 150 years. It's like a four-story attic. <laughs> yeah, very much so. The cast of characters who once roamed these streets left behind a serious treasure trove. Some of the more cherished items include the preserved chuck wagon from Frank Springer's CS Ranch, a sampling of Springer's prized fossilized crinoids, many of which were donated to the Smithsonian, and the two-headed calf that greets you upon entry, oddities and artifacts galore. And now, here's another New Mexico true treasure. Hi, I'm Martin Ledger, and I want to tell you about the true treasure that is Fort Union National Monument. It gives you that real sense of what life was like out on the prairie. Uh, the, then, then when you look at the ruins, uh, you, can, you can just uh, feel the, the soldiers and the garrisons there of, uh, of, of the wagons and all the supplies they were bringing in to supply the rest of the forts. You, you see westerns and you kind of like imagine what life was kind of like, but when you actually see the ruins, you can, you can even, even feel it and you can say, hey, wow, you have these ruins that can tell the story. It's, it's something that you can actually see, something you can actually touch, uh, really brings it to life and, and makes you understand and appreciate uh, what, uh, what, what these people went through, to these soldiers went through to, to build this country and to build this state. Up next, a mercantile on the old Santa Fe Trail. Do you need a reason to hit the road? Find out about upcoming events around the state at newmexico.org. Just over two hours north of Santa Fe on US 64 is the town of Cimarron. And in the heart of town, you'll find shops and galleries whose contents are as colorful as the history of this old western town. At Cimarron Blue, you're introduced to local artists and craftsmen whose artwork lines the walls and the flavors of the region are bottled in the culinary treats on their shelves. But if you want immediate gratification for your taste buds, head next door to the Cimarron Art Gallery and see if you can grab a stool at the historic soda fountain, which has been delighting locals and travelers since the 1930s. A favorite of the Boy Scouts from neighboring Philmont Scout Ranch, this old-fashioned ice cream shop's desserts are as classic as the memorabilia decorating the walls, and the vintage charm can be felt all the way down to the original oak floorboards. 
But if you want to take a step further back in time, head over to 12th Street to the Outfitter, a mercantile serving as a strong reminder you are standing on the old Santa Fe Trail. The pioneer spirit of Cimarron is felt in every item here, and the woman keeping this spirit alive is Shirley Dale. So Shirley, you got a lot of awesome stuff in here. So can you tell me about the shop and the kind of the things that you have in here? I try to stay with a certain period in time. I try not to be very modern, but the people that ha make primitive, handmade, uh, traditional things are dying off. So it's getting harder to stay with a period in time. But I start uh, very early with rendezvous period in time, which was pre-1840 and come up through some collectibles. And so it's an eclectic shop. I have people that live in a lot of places that make things for me. So you have people that actually know these crafts and, and, and still have the skill to make them exactly how they would have been, you know, hundreds of years ago. And do you make anything? Do you, do you I have do. a craft? Yes, I do. I make uh, soft leather goods. I make uh, coats. I make dance team, uh, Native American dance team things. I make ladies' dresses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've made wedding dresses out of leather. I make coats, period, to the 1700s. I make rifle scabbards and quivers for arrows, medicine pouches, all out of soft leathers. Wow. And mine are crafted by hand. They're not sewn on the sewing machine. Okay. And so that makes a difference, right. too. Why is it important to you to keep that alive? We're losing it. Mm -hmm. um, we're losing our history. It's uh, hard. It really is. It's hard to keep history alive. Shirley is certainly doing her part to make the Old West accessible to the modern day traveler. Handmade and locally sourced, treasures abound at the Outfitter. We're glad you could come along with us as we've traveled the lands of so many trailblazers and where adventure still awaits. And with that being said, what are you doing next weekend? 